everyone. Welcome to the Manga and Libraries webinar series. I'm Jillian Ehlers, the president of the New York City School Librarians Association and the Japanese Culture and Manga Special Collections Librarian for the New York City Department of Ed. Many librarians find themselves with lots of unanswered questions about manga readership, manga collection development, manga programming, and more. These questions will be answered by experts in a series of webinars about manga in libraries. Tonight's topic is Manga in Libraries, Representation of Girls and Women in Manga. Experts will discuss the social context of gender expectations in Japan, sexuality and fan service in manga, titles with positive representation, and more. These webinars are sponsored by the American Library Association's Graphic Novels and Comics Roundtable, who also hosts a series of webinars about graphic novels and libraries. You can follow them on Twitter at LibComics for more information. You can also follow us on Twitter at NISLA to get more information about the upcoming Manga and Libraries webinars. So let's get started by having each expert introduce themselves. I'll go first. Um, my name is April Gerke. I am a PhD in East Asian Studies, concentrating on uh, Japanese contemporary history and culture. Uh, and I got my PhD at NYU, and I currently work in the CUNY system, particularly at Hunter College and Baruch College, teaching a variety of courses on um, Japanese popular culture, the history of manga, et cetera, et cetera. And I am Ashley Hawkins. I am also a New York City School Librarian. Um, I run the animation and illustration uh, collection development collection, um, cooperative collection. Um, and I also have a background in feminist theory. I am Christina Gavin. I am also a New York City School Librarian. I do not run a specialized collection, but I have a pretty significant manga collection in my library and I run an anime club with my students. Deb Raoki, um, I'm a manga journalist. I write for Publishers Weekly um, and occasionally for Anime News Network. I am also run a podcast with uh, called Manga Splaining, where we explain manga to people who don't read much manga. Yep, it's a very good podcast if you haven't listened to it. Um, I'm Sarah Smith, and I'm a high school librarian um, from Sanger, California, uh, which is in the middle of the state. And I um, don't have like specialty expertise. I just read a lot of manga and I collect it for my students. So I have like thousands of volumes for my students and I'm, uh, I'm just an avid reader. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So let's get to the questions. Our first question always have multiple parts, these questions. Uh, what are the cultural expectations of girls and women in Japan, traditional and modern? What do we need to understand about gender expectations in Japan? And how might this knowledge influence our understanding of the manga that we read? Uh, so again, I'll, I'll get started on this. I think this is also really like sort of in my wheelhouse. Um, uh, as far as like gender expectations uh, in Japan versus what you see in comics. Um, and obviously manga, uh, it's definitely a fantasy world. So uh, you do get to see some like play with gender that wouldn't necessarily like happen in everyday life. But at the same time, uh, it's, you know, also a, a really cool way to sort of learn reading manga is a neat way to learn about, you know, the possibilities of what people want to push for. Um, as far as traditional uh, gender expectations versus modern ones. Uh, there's some ways in which it has changed a lot over time and there's some ways in which it hasn't changed a lot in Japan, I think. Um, I don't want to go too far back, but I think most people are familiar with like, uh, like World War II era Japan and the whole good wife, wise mother dichotomy uh, that was really pushed uh, by the Japanese government at the time where women, their place in society was to be, you know, the mothers, um, birthing children for the nation, et cetera. Um, and so then in the post-war period, there is a big shift, certainly a shift away um, from um, the more militarist government uh, of uh, wartime Japan, obviously. But there is also a push for the place of women, particularly going into you know, the economic miracle time period and through the 80s of um, how women can then aid sort of in the economy um, and it was definitely, it was both encouraged, you know, by the government and in schools, government run schools um, of women, you know, there's the husband 
who's supposed to go off and work and the woman stays home and she manages all the finances but and raises the children and so like it was this um particular kind of modern nuclear family very heteronormative very cisnormative modern nuclear family um that was really pushed in in media in schools um you know the traditional like girls get sent to home ed classes things like that um until uh, today, and there has certainly been a push for women who want to, well, either both men and women who don't want to get married right away or want to put off having children, um, and women who want to um, go and work, whereas it used to be the expectation of you, women only worked in an office until they got married, and then you left. Um, and so there's definitely been a, you know, a pushback, I think, amongst uh, younger women, uh, a push for more uh, independence and like, their whole lives not just being around uh, marriage and things like that, but there is still definitely, certainly in the government um, and in sort of wider media circles, there is definitely still this more this view of, you know, women, woman as housewife, and that's how you see it often represented in like commercials and things like that. Um, and so it is then often in like manga and other mass culture um, objects that you get to see like a wider range of things for girls to do. Um, and so that's my sort of short uh, discussion of uh, sort of the wider place of women in society and I want to cede the floor to, to other people to to comment as well. Well I want to say that um, we were talking a little bit before this meeting about uh, the different genres of manga that there's like shoujo for girls, shonen for boys, seinen for men, jose for women mm -hmm. and I think one of the interesting things is over the past maybe 10-15 years those classifications don't matter as much anymore. Um, I think b before you could you could read manga that was for boys or men that was very manly, and the women were object objectified. <laughs> um, and, but now you're seeing a lot of shonen manga, for example, which is created by female creators or created with female readers in mind. In fact, more 50 or 60 percent of the readers are female. Um, so, but as as April was saying, manga is a fantasy world, right? It doesn't necessarily I think sometimes what people, what fans sometimes have a problem with is may, they may go to Japan, they may have a, a, a view of Japan as being like this anime manga fantasy world, and it's not like that. Um, there is a lot of things that I think women in Japan still struggle with. There's a lot of things that people who are not uh, heterosexual deal with. Um, we see a lot of gender bending, for example, in manga. We see a lot of gay relationships in manga. But facts remain that, you know, gay relationships are largely not recognized or not, not uh, treated equally. Um, gay marriage is still a hot topic. Um, and I think one thing that's nice about manga is manga allows, I think, re readers ex uh, exposure to new ideas and new ways of looking at gender and um, and relationships that they may not see in their everyday life. And I think that's true for comics and I think that's true for manga, but I think the danger is to look at manga as a window into Japan and not uh, necessarily, it's not necessarily a realistic uh, window into Japan. But also, at this, but by the same reason, um, what we can, there are cultural differences and what we, what an Americans, North Americans may consider to be very titillating or uh, uh, gasp inducing, <laughs> parent angering, um, is not considered that in Japan. I mean, there's a lot of kids manga, for example, that never makes it to America because it is considered too, too uh, raunchy, too, too uh, violent for kids. Uh, so I just, we just have to accept that there are going to be different culture. Where you're dealing with a medium that is created expressly mostly for Japanese audiences. And the fact that it gets an overseas audience is considered a bonus. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, um, I, I recently did a lot of work um, helping um, elementary and middle school librarians with their collection development. And um, one, one of the things that I really had to explain was that there's a very different bathing culture in Japan and that there's communal bathing and that it's very normal for children to bathe with not just their family members, but also with other members of the community that are older than them. And that children are not quite seen, like a naked child is not quite seen the same way. And that, you know, there's reasons why 
coming across each other in the bath is like a common trope because you know you share bath water like it's very common to fill your bath and then people in the family share it and go in after each other you don't just drain it after like there's certain things that are different practices in Japan and um it's just very interesting to kind of parse through how those differences you know sort of permeate and then we as Americans put certain ideas into it and then yeah we don't get certain texts that have wider themes and wider stories that would be really amazing to get over here and it's because maybe there's just one or two scenes that they think are just a hard no-go here in the states I would just say that, that's, that to be compassionate about this, but also to read carefully, um, that manga sometimes will change tone in mid run. Mm -hmm. And so what seems sometimes like a very charming, like even art wise may seem like a really cute teen series may suddenly in mid, mid series turn into a very grown up series. Um, the, the art sometimes I think what, what trips a lot of people up is manga can look the same visually, right? Like it looks like kid stuff universally, but sometimes characters that are drawn that look very young are really not. Characters that look like their children are can seem heavily sexualized to to uh, a not a not trained eye. Like my goodness, this girl looks like she's eight, but she has huge boobs. What's up with that? <laughs> And that's that's just one of the minefields you have to deal with when you're developing a manga collection. Sad to say. Thank you. So I know that we touched on this a little bit already, but I just wanted to ask it in case we had additional ideas to share. Uh, so the next question, multiple parts. <laughs> While manga allows us to learn about Japanese culture, we also need to consider that fantasy is applied. When it comes to gender, sexuality, and identity, how is manga used and as an expressive outlet for mangaka? Um, I think Deb already sort of uh, mentioned this and, and spoke about it very well. But yeah, one of the things you sort of have to introduce to sort of new readers in America or not in Japan, you know, like Western readers of manga and things of how, yeah, like this isn't actually Japan. Like the Japan that's depicted in, in manga or in anime isn't actually Japan. Sure, you can learn about Japanese culture and you can learn about a variety of things, but um, you, you shouldn't go to Japan expecting it to be um, just like this. And so I think that that speaks back to sort of this fantasy space of manga um, in, both, in both positive and negative ways, because I think, I also think that we've sort of teased this out a little already, but how like manga can be the space of playing with gender and sexuality. And like oftentimes, yeah, you will have gender bending characters and it's treated very blase, you know, um, and sort of like having those examples out there, whereas it is not treated quite so blase in Japanese culture every day. Um, and obviously depending on like where you are and like the subcultures and the age of people around you, but it does show like, possibility, I guess you, you could say. Um, and uh, so, so just like realizing that difference, I think especially for, if we're thinking specifically about American readers um, of, of manga and anime, you know, it, it's something that I sometimes try to like make sure my students know in class, especially, you know, they're interested in studying in Japan and I want to encourage that, but also being like, you know, don't, you can't show up speaking like an anime character and expect people to take you seriously or to, you know, treat, treat like an onsen in Japan, like it's treated in an anime where it is sometimes like it's played as humor that everyone's bathing together and things like that when, it, you know, there's cultural mores that you're supposed to follow uh, in them. So um, yeah, like learning that the line between fantasy, both as a, an escape from reality, um, but then also um, particularly for foreign fans, you know, realizing what's, what they should expect and not. And, and Japan has a history of this kind of gender bending in its cultural media anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kabuki has both has both male and female characters, but they're all played by men. Mm -hmm. Takanazuka has male and female characters that are only played by women, for example. And that kind of gender bending is considered natural and part of the cultural, uh, cultural fabric of Japan. But interesting, and then like you're gonna see like 
I see this more often in, Jap in Japanese manga, like for example, in currently in One Piece, there are two um, uh, trans transgender characters or characters that identify as different genders than how they represent, right? So Yamato is ostensibly a daughter, but she says, I'm Oden, I'm a man. I, and the other, another one, Kiku, Kikuyo says, I, looks, I am a woman at heart. Right? So then that's in a shonen magazine. Another, make, another one that Kiss came up is uh, Boys Run the Riot, which is by a trans artist uh, about a trans man, young man, who is finding his identity, finding his identity while being in high school in Japan. And so, I, and of course, you know, my, um, my brother's husband, right? So there are more and more manga out there that is striving to represent the real struggles of being uh, not gender, not heterosexual in Japan, not just the fantasy. Yeah, and I just have to say Boys Run the Riot is probably my, my favorite manga that I think has been published this year because I think it is like one of those manga that finally is delving a bit more into the reality of what it means to be trans in Japan, because it isn't, you know, as much of that playful fantasy. It, it does have some like real re hard hitting reality of like, it isn't easy um, necessarily to identify this way. And um, yeah, I think, I, I think we do um, as, somebody who also is just a manga and anime fan, um, uh, I belong to circles that are constantly pushing back on other anime and manga fans. Like, you know, remember Japan is not what you see in anime, you know? And um, there's a few sites that you can kind of go to to kind of get a clearer vision of that. Like I, there's Unseen Japan does a really good job of like, you know, really pushing back on that narrative. Um, and they, I think when you kind of follow that reporting and that, um, uh, also what I really like about Unseen Japan is they translate tweets that are from actual like Japanese women and represent, um, okay, here's what actual Japanese women are saying about Japanese women's issues in Japan. And, um, I think when you start to hear, one of the things that I really wanted to do when I, when I started to like do my whole manga librarian thing is I really wanted to get the voices of actual Japanese women um, and Japanese people so that I could have a really clear vision of like what is fetishization, what is not fetishization, what is just fantasy and just being very, as I'm talking with students and working with students who um, maybe might have some misconceptions that are driven by fandom or driven by their own wishes for what they want Japan to be. Um, I really want to like sometimes push back on that, make sure that we're having like a really clear image of like, what is this world and why, why does manga have these particular fantasies? So. Um, a manga that I recently read was um, The Bride with a Boy by Chi. And that was a really interesting look at the author's own journey as a trans woman. And it also kind of unpacked a lot of cultural ideas and they, they made it a point to draw the comparisons between certain rules in Japan versus how they play out in different Western countries, like comparing and contrasting laws around marriage in the United States versus in Japan. So it was very interesting. It was a creative work in the sense that it wasn't every single fact that happened and the artist brought in her own creativity and told the story in kind of a funny way. But it also gave you, um, like kind of Ashley was saying, like a realistic look at what's happening. It's not the, I don't know, it's not a fantasy, it's like a slice of life, but Kind of comparing and contrasting cultural norms where they live versus in other parts of the world. I think another interesting one is um, My Androgynous Boyfriend um, from uh, Seven Seas. It's a really interesting look at a, a, a woman who is a professional, like she's in her 20s, and her boyfriend is uh, very androgynously beautiful. And so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of expression out there of these different ideas that are more than just 
uh, just gender bending for fun or you know making the cross-dressing character the, the butt of the joke and it's great that manga has got in this day like even more of a wide appeal and so maybe as, as in, I'm in high school maybe a student who might not pick up Janet Malcolm's memoir might pick up this manga and learn something from it um, just because they're a manga fan they might stumble across it and it might open their eyes or it might they might end up seeing themselves reflected in it so it's really great that manga can serve as a vehicle for telling all these different types of stories. And I think also what's like being um, allowed or accepted to be published both in Japan and in America has definitely come really far because yes when you think about transgender um, representation in manga in particular you know we in back in the day there was say the Rose of Versailles which features a character who many people um, interpret as being transgender although in the text they never actually say that but it's a um, Oscar is you know AFAB and uh, but then she's raised as a boy and she's you know um, this whole you know that whole story and so many people do did look at that as you know oh this is you know a trans character um, even if there's like problematic bits in the story relating to transness but you know now then we have things you know written by actual trans um, artists and it's sort of like you had to have that to have this <laughs> um, you know for better or for worse uh, and then same goes with um, you know gay relationships in manga where it used to be just played for humor or just played for like titillation whereas now you have more manga that actually like treats it as like a legitimate love story so um, I think definitely seeing sort of that evolution uh, and how we get to see relationships and gender and et cetera, et cetera, is very important as well. Yeah, I was just going to add how the mangaka use this, use manga as a way to explore and, and even liberate characters from gender expectations and sexual stereotypes. And just to connect to what Christina said, that it gives students an opportunity to see themselves a lot of these stories, students are also exploring these things and to be able to explore it through manga, I think is really important. Um, so let's move on to our next question. Um, moving in a little different direction, what is fan service? Uh, what does it look like in Shonen? And what elements of fan service could be considered problematic? I know this could be a whole webinar, but focusing on the representation of women and focusing on manga and libraries. So can I jump in here? I please, have a, please. a very yeah. uh, new understanding of what fan service was. I, I heard the term and I had no idea what people were talking about. It's not really something that, I don't know, I guess I could Google it and figure it out, but it's not something like when you start reading manga, you're just like, oh, there it is. That's obviously it right there. Um, and so the one that made me aware of it was uh, Made in Abyss. And the main character is a little girl, like eight years old. Like kind of what Deb was talking about earlier is we have different ideologies of what is acceptable with kids and their nakedness. Um, but I felt it was just over the top, like totally sexualized this little girl and not in a way that was like, okay, well, we're naked in the bath together. That's fine. Like she was being uh, punished for doing misdeeds by like being stripped down naked and, and whipped. And I was just like, <laughs> really taken aback by it. But now that was like the glass shattering for me. That was like December of last year. And now I see it everywhere. So um, kind of like going back and reading or, or thinking about reading stuff I've already read, like, okay, was that fan service -y? Like they had this whole thing going on. So um, for me, what, what strikes me the most with fan service is the ridiculously large boobies with the really small, like, like you're only covering the nipple. <laughs> like, like, let's be real that there's no structural support there. Um, and then the, um, like there's, there's an element of it that is the nakedness, but not necessarily like, I just read something recently where it was, a. Uh, like a ritualistic cleansing. And so she was naked. So that's what, not really fan service like she's being cleansed. Um, but then the upshots up the skirts, like the girls like this or something, and you're looking like the way it's drawn is you're basically looking up her skirt. Like to me, that is like gratuitous fan service. <laughs> you are doing that because you know your readers are dudes and they want to see some jonies. Like, 
<laughs> um, so <laughs> that that kind of stuff to me can be pretty problematic. Um, I don't think knock on wood, wherever it is. I don't think if I had stuff like that in the library that I would have parents coming up plain and like, hey, you're seeing these girls underwear. Um, but my hard line has always been the overly sexualized nakedness. Like not the ritualistic cleansing, not the bath. I can explain some of those things away, but just um, girls being naked or rape scenes, um, any sort of non-consensual sex hard pass. Like that is not going to fly just for me as a person. I don't want to put that in front of my students, but also that's not going to fly with my administrators, with my parents. Like that's not okay. Um, so those kinds of titles, like I get to the po point in that story and I'm like, well, I can't buy this volume anymore. <laughs> Kids are like, why don't you have volume four? And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not buying it, <laughs> you know? Um, so it, it can be pretty problematic with that kind of stuff. I want to differentiate between explicit content and fan service. Fan service is largely um, that little peak of something naughty to titillate the fans. Um, it kind of comes, there's a history of it in shonen manga for long, long ways, but kind of like, you know, like there would be older guys who would freeze frame Sailor Moon during the transformation sequences because they thought it was kind of sexy. But so look, it's basically, Fan service means exactly that. We're putting in something slightly naughty or like something slightly titillating so for certain fans. Um, and that's different than putting in gratuitously violent uh, rape scenes, whatever. That's not a service. That's some, like Berserk, for example, has a lot of strong, um, very traumatic scenes, but that's not fan service. That's meant to shock the audience as well. That's meant to shock and horrify them as well. Fan service is a little bit more like, um, ooh, look, you know, like there's a butt shot. Or like, you know, like, oh, she like, oh, she like fell down and like the, the, the male character landed in the middle of two girls' boobs, you know, silly comedy kind of thing. So it's it I'm not trying to say that it's it's right, but I am saying that it it is largely meant in a much more lighthearted way. For the most part. There is I will say that I rarely, when I go to Japan, that um, I see schoolgirls in very short skirts. And I'm, but at the same time, I'm told very explicitly, don't wear anything cut below your, un, below the bottom of your uh, armpits. Anything that scoop that shows your boobs is considered very, very rude and uncool. Um, I'm amazed at Japanese schoolgirls all the time because I think, my God, they have, they have legs of iron because it can be like 30 degrees out and they're still wearing super short skirts. Like, oh my God. But at the same time, like I've been in train stations, like if you know this about Japan, the phones, the cameras, all the cameras have to have to give a sound when it's shot. Like you cannot turn off that, that shutter sound. That is to avoid up, upskirt shots. So it's Japanese people take, Japanese police take this fairly seriously. Like if you act upon these types of things, you're gonna get punished. If you grope a woman on the train, you're gonna get punished, you're gonna lose your job. If you take an upskirt shot, you're gonna get you're gonna get a flying tackle from the train police. <laughs> you're warned. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that even speaks back to when we were taught like I think some of it can be like cultural differences. Um, as you were saying, Deb, yeah, like the difference between like, yeah, fan service, this is obviously like meant to, yeah, just be a little titillating thing versus um, actual like graphic content, either just to be pornographic or yeah, to like shock the audience. Um, but yeah, the, the differences in how these things are treated in real life in Japan, I think, yeah, is also Im important to think about and how, yeah, like you can't turn off the shutter sound uh, on your phone because then to prevent people from taking yeah, upskirt shots and things. Um, and while I do think that there has been like a push to take these things more seriously, like people taking upskirt shots, um, women being groped on the train, I do think, I, I think it has gotten much better very recently, but for a very long, long time in Japan, like if you like told on someone who groped you on the train, they, the, the train station police or the train station, the, the tenant at the train station would be like, 
why do you want to ruin this guy's life? Like it would be a little victim blaming. I think it has definitely changed and there has been a push. Um, and you know, and they have like women only cars for in the morning, although even that can be a little victim blamey. But you know, I think that there's still, I think that there is some pushback and I think people know it's inappropriate. Um, whereas oftentimes in manga, it's just treated as humorous. Um, but I don't think like, that doesn't mean people don't do it. Um, and that like, it's not, um, out there a lot still in Japan. So I do think that there is still kind of this weird gap in, I do think like if you asked a Japanese person, they'd be like, no, like you don't, you shouldn't be doing that. But the fact is that it does exist and people like still think they can get away with it at the same time. Um, in the same way that, uh, you know, the, the gravier, the like sort of soft porn girls in bikinis magazines are like right next to the manga in kombini in convenience stores in Japan. You know, it's like, it. I think a lot of people in Japan are uncomfortable with that, but there's still the normalizing of having those things right next to each other. Um, and it's sort of, so it's sort of this weird, I think most people would be like, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with that, but it's also not changing uh, immediately. So I think this sort of weird, it's this like sort of weird both sides almost. Uh, and then having it in manga is then like a different level. I'm not sure if I'm like explaining myself uh, very well, but. Speaking to what um, April was just saying, in the first volume of Not Your Idol, um, there's a, you see that like there's a girl is like being harassed on the train and her friends stood up for her and people are like, that's the guy's like, I wasn't doing that. And then people are like, why would you ruin his life? And there are, they start this like women's only cars and it is like very victim blaming. Like another girl is saying like, oh, only ugly girls would blah, blah, blah. And like they show the kind of, um, internalized misogyny that goes along with these sorts of attitudes and it's not necessarily putting the blame on girls that have internalized those messages but just that this is a societal problem and like what can be done about the societal problem as a school librarian um, manga and other graphic formats kind of present this unique challenge where I'm very uh laissez-faire about what is in the library if the students are requesting it like go for it yes um and you can include a lot of things I can have like a lot of uh leeway when it comes to just printed text um versus <laughs> like it's a, a very different when like a sex scene is written out in a book versus when a sex scene is illustrated in a manga and I was I Jillian and Ashley will know like there was a time I was like pushing like the director of New York City School Libraries and saying like please tell me I specifically what am I allowed to have and because I like I would like to be as lenient and like as if other schools are allowed to have this like we can have it but at the same time I don't want to get in trouble because like am I using federal funds to buy like kind of like kiddie porn for the students it's like certain things are like bordering the line and Deb was kind of saying like some things are seen as humorous but if you either have been sexually or indecently assaulted yourself or know people who have like I don't want to take the risk of my students being like no it's just like a joke if you touch an unconscious woman's like genitals that's like a funny joke because I read it in seven deadly sins volume one like it's like I have to so it's like kind of walking this fine line of somebody somewhere thought this was fine but like do I think this is fine and not to like center my students like I'm aware that it's developmentally appropriate to be like curious about people's bodies whatever like but can I get away with having this in the school and like if I do what message is that sending to my students I think one of the challenges that I face is I my population is grade six through 12. So I have 11 year olds and 18 year olds sharing the same manga collection because I am not about to divide my manga for any reason. So I just have to be really mindful when I'm selecting titles, like will this work for both populations? And Ashley and I actually had a conversation the other day because there's a particular manga. Uh, I, I don't even wanna say it, Fire Force, okay? I'm like, have like so many, feelings about Fire Force. Ash is probably like, okay, Julian, we talk about this all the time, but like, I like this story, but then just like constantly, I read the first three, the first three books and it's just, I was looking for patterns and the patterns are constantly there and it's the non-consensual touching. 
but it's the non-consensual touching with the mixed messages from the female characters. So there's a scene where one of the boys falls onto a girl, his hand goes up her bra, she's, he squeezes her boob and she's angry and she has an angry face, but also at the same time, she has like a little ooh with a heart. I'm like, so while she is showing anger, she's also showing that she's like, likes it. And then that's confusing for readers. It's confusing for the male identified readers, female identified readers about consent on both sides, what it looks like. And, and I think that that's something that I have to consider when I'm collecting, like I look for, if there's non-consensual touching with mixed messages, I cannot have it in my library. If there are, if it happens one time and there's consequences, like the mangaka makes it very clear that this is unacceptable and this is how the characters maybe said punished. And okay, there's a lesson there, but if it's just like constantly happening, this part of the story for humor or whatever, then, then it's not okay. Yeah, that's a good that's a good line to draw, I think, and I think I think that's really concrete. Um, but it, I, I I sympathize with you because it means that you have you've had to read all of it to look for those patterns and identify them as such. That's tough. And it's like on my case, I'm like, there are things that the students have asked for in the in school library that I'm like, well that's. Let me show you how to get that at the public library. <laughs> Do you want to put it on hold? Let's, let's look on the computer at the public library. So that's, I don't feel bad if I'm telling the students, like, we don't have that in here at school for this reason, but I'm very happy to show you, like, how you can get it because, I mean, some of the manga do kind of, like, toe the line where it's, like, kind of, like, a kinky, sexy thing. And, like, if you're a teenager, you, when I was a teenager, I would, like, to read a kinky, sexy thing. Like, School would not be my, my venue of choice, but so like I can help you find that outside of the school. It's available and like the public library is happy to provide it to you. If you are over 13, you can borrow whatever you want in New York City. Um, so definitely not like censoring it, but also not including it at school necessarily. Yeah, I'm on the, I'm on the same page of like, you know, there are other places you can get this. Um, so for example, with Berserk, which I actually find a lot of value in. I really love Berserk. We only have the first three volumes and it's set, and it's only digital, it's only in overdrive, and it's set at the adult level, so only, only my 11th and 12th graders can check it out. And it's like, I, I know that only particular students are gonna go seek it out. Like, it's not even in my anime and manga collected thing. Like. You've almost got to come find me and then I'll tell you where it is. And it's only the first few volumes so you can get a taste. And then I'm going to go send you off to the Brooklyn Public Library to go read the rest. Because I do want you to have some exposure to some to an artist that is really amazing. The story actually has great value, but there is like there is very, very intense stuff in Berserk. And, you know, I'm not going to have it on a, as a physical volume. Like, that's one of the benefits of digital collections is, like, I can kind of age select it and kind of guard some of my more innocent patrons um, from some things that maybe they're just not prepared for. And then introduce my more mature patrons to things that they might be ready to kind of grapple with. And... One thing I do want to point out about fan, fan service is that fan service actually has like an even wider definition than we've even talked about. Like fan service just literally means things that service fans. Um, when I sit down and watch Gundam, which for Jillian has heard me talk way too much about Gundam lately. Um, when I'm watching the cool things where the robots are doing stuff, that's fan service. Like getting a close up of like people what they want <laughs> it's literally the fans are being serviced it's also called um a, a sebesukato or a service cut it's like it's literally just this is what i want the end of avengers endgame that's fan service that's all pure fan service so it's like you know it is i think when i heard that definition that helped me kind of like start to think about fan service in different ways. And also like at the end of the day, I'm also an adult woman that reads adult manga sometimes. When Yakuza Lover came out recently, I was very excited. I loved Yakuza Lover. It's so trashy good. fun, so trashy. 
<laughs> so it's like, and as a woman, I find that really empowering that now I can buy things that are made for the female gaze um, and are all about like pleasing me as an adult manga reader. And it's just, yeah, the thing is as a school librarian, unfortunately we do have to read a lot. We do have to know what's in there. And I mean, we have to do it with our regular collection too. We, I mean, the public library, they have a lot of freedom because they can buy everything and it's all kind of protected under censorship and whatnot. But we, have, we serve a community that we need to be understanding of their developmental states and we need to, there's so many like moving factors and it's like, it's not censorship, it's selection. And we have to select appropriately. And if there are students that maybe are a little bit more mature or a little bit more ready, that's when we can go to our public librarian friends and be like, hey, hook this, hook this kid up. So, yeah. Yeah, so the, the last point is that manga is a fan-driven industry. Those editors, those publishers, they wanna obviously make what you want so that they could sell you what you want and you will buy it. But I think we're gonna move to the next question because fan service isn't you know, just for boys. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about shoujo and how girls are represented in shoujo and maybe if there are any stereotypes that are perpetuated in shoujo about girls, thoughts about shoujo. Um, well, just to also, bring us back to actually something we were sort of talking about right before we started, but yeah, this this delineation of like shoujo for like girls manga, shonen, boys manga, and then like seinen for, that's aimed at adult men and jose, adult women, um, that actually in Japan, those uh, like differentiations really has more to do with the magazines that they're published in weekly or monthly in Japan. And so it doesn't actually say anything about the artist the like gender of the artist or the characters in it and I think we were talking about some of our potential recommendations that like you know I was looking at something and I'm like the main characters in this are you know 12 year old girls they're not sexualized <laughs> thankfully uh but it's a seinen manga technically um and so that like those delineations don't always um tell you what's going to be in it of course there are the like famous like shonen manga are all the boys fighting and they're ninjas or something um and shoujo is you if you think of shoujo it's always the sparkly eyed girls who are fawning over um probably a boy or something like that so there are those like tropes that i think go with them um but i think that if you want to find like good representations of women uh, in manga or even good representations of men in manga you know like positive um, examples that you might want to give to, to young people. Like, I think you have to like look outside those particular um, genre conventions to find, and you'll find some really good stuff. Um, but I yeah, want to see the floor, let other people talk. <laughs> I would say like, like for example, one, one manga I think is really fun is like Komi Can't Communicate, which is, a, it's basically a shonen manga, but it's about a, a girl who's very pretty, but um, finds it very, very difficult to speak and much less make friends. And it's a really charming series, but it's it's a shonen manga and you wouldn't think so. I think sometimes like this this kind of this kind of misunderstanding of what the genre is, sometimes maybe people think Ranma one half is a shoujo manga. It is not. <laughs> um, but as you know as far as stereotypes in shoujo manga, there are some stereotypes, right? The girl is very quiet, the girl is very sweet. Uh, the boys are very, you know, clueless. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and, but you know, you'll you'll find like there's some interesting um, variations on the theme. Like Yon of the Dawn is a fantasy adventure, and the, the princess is the hero. Um, prince. Uh, there's also like um, Horomiya, which is about a girl who um, takes in this guy who is, is he seems like a loner, but he's actually tattooed and very cool when he's not around other guys. Um, there's all kinds of different, um, what's another one? Um, I also want to argue that Kimi ni Todoke is about a girl who looks like she's in a horror co comic, like she's in a horror movie. She's very shy, but she finds love and she finds friendship. So, you know, sometimes there are, there are some tropes about sho shoujo manga that mean like, oh, the girls are all passive or the girls are victims of these boy aggressive, these boys 
machinations or mind games or whatever. But I think there's variety out there. Yeah, and it's important to note that um, shoujo manga, well, it's not like totally tied to the rise of feminism in Japan. There is like this, they rose kind of at the same time of female mangaka um, becoming the writers and creators of shoujo manga at the same time. And so like this interiority of female life rising up at the same time as Japanese feminism um, means that shoujo manga has a particular lineage that um, is kind of tied to feminism in Japan, which is one of the reasons why I think I'm kind of attached to like retro um, shoujo and things like things by like Moto Hagyo and um, Ryoko Ikeda, like all those like really classic titles because I think there is like, there are like certain things that are being discussed and talked about. I can think of a, a couple of different series that I really enjoy, Yona the Dawn being one of them, Fushigi Yugi, um, uh, Snow White with the Red Hair, Donna the Arcana, where like the fantasy girl shoujo, shoujo manga, like they're really naive and not very strong at the very beginning. Um, and then it's usually a, a growth story where they become like powerful in their own, own mind. So there's kind of this tendency of saying that shoujo female protagonists are weak and they're dumb and they're stupid and they're just like naive. And it, it might start off that way, but a lot of times there is there's stuff in the series as it progresses that surprises you just like a lot of American fantasy too like I feel like sometimes the protagonists are really dumb at the beginning and then oh they like go on this journey and and learn all kinds of things about themselves um so it's it's there's a, a variety of you know character tropes and stuff but I think if you continue with them a lot of times the series like pulls the trope on its head yeah, I was thinking about what, while a lot of the protagonists may be seen as naive and very emotional and very sensitive, uh, many times that they're struggling with some serious, some serious things like self-confidence and gender and sexual identity and bullying or physical and emotional abuse, possibly by a, a partner. So a lot of these things can happen in the series, but also as a uh, librarian collecting books for kids, I need to also make sure that the, the right titles are getting into the right kids' hands because a lot of these topics can be very triggering for kids. So being mindful of my collection in that way as well. Um, and I feel like uh, sort of going off with what Sarah was just saying of like the shoujo protagonists often are looked at. Yeah, they're usually people complain because like, oh, they're too whiny or they're too naive and stuff. But I think like particularly like a really big I don't know if it's like technically a subgenre of shoujo, but like magic, magical girl series, I think are really great examples of um, very like girl power stuff, but like not always in, I don't know, sometimes girl power things in American um, uh, animation gets a little, a little too on the nose. Whereas, um, you know, with magical girl in um, Japan, not that, not that it's not, out its own faults but you know it's a lot like there's the female main character who maybe she's clumsy or you know maybe she's a little naive but then she's given maybe a mission to save the world and then like because usually like it's only boys who get that like mission um versus now with magical girl it's really like giving girls uh you know that power and then oftentimes it's like it's those those emotions, those overly strong emotions that women are usually told to, to keep in, it's those very emotions that give her her power, you know? Um, and then you also generally get like a good cast of many different kinds of girls, many different kinds of women. Um, you know, I mean, I'm most, I, I'm right now thinking very much of Sailor Moon that each of the Sailor Scouts has an individual personality and they're all very different. So like, if you don't identify with Sailor Moon, the main character, maybe you identify with Sailor Jupiter, who's maybe a little more of a tomboy, but like she also likes to cook, you know? So those give you a lot of good options for like good representation, I think. And also since the magical girl genre has been around for so long, there's probably a series out there for everyone, you know? Um, and then there's even like the sort of 
dark like takedowns of magical girl like uh and things you know that maybe take those series and maybe try to make them a little more serious not just love and friendship save the day so you know i think that that's the kind of like uh girl oriented series maybe that like you know there's a lot of variety um that you could definitely i think offer um, um the question young people is reading sorry, the Go ahead. sorry the, the question also mentioned like kind of what stereotypes do these type of manga perpetuate and for me something that came up was that they are very heteronormative if there's a romance it's generally there's cute boy and like the girl is very pretty and she likes this cute boy um so I think for some of our students who are members of the LGBTQ community it might be maybe not like isolating but it might be like kind of a stretch to see themselves in the stories that are being told um so that's just something to be mindful of like and then again some of it has to do with you know publishing and translation like what is available so if you wanted to have an equal amount of yaoi miri that's like wholesome for for students in school you'd be hard pressed because it's not all available it's not available in as it's disproportionately available. I mean, I would say like one of the more interesting female female relationships I've seen in manga is Even Though We're Adults uh, by Takako Shimura. Um, it is it is basically for uh, adults, but it's not it's not explicit. And it's um, it's about two women who find each other, but one is married and they deal with the complexities of having a relationship. Um, there's a bunch. Uh, <laughs> shoujo manga is interesting because it, it, it does cater towards a certain type of story. But I think there's like, if we're talking about like uh, different sex relationships or love triangles, try Blue Flag. Blue Flag is an interesting love quadrangle <laughs> where there's two guys and two, two boys and two girls. And they kind of like, yeah, that's complicated, man. <laughs> But it's it's a it's a wonderful read and it's uh, it's actually shown in jump title. Yeah, I I wanted to add also just not to like always bring it back to Magical Girl, but I do actually think it, a lot of times, particularly in shoujo, um, if you look at background characters, there's often some pretty decent LGBT uh, representation. Um, I mean, I think I I mentioned Sailor Moon, and I think there's really obvious representation there. And I also think again, it's a um, uh, again maybe slightly cultural difference of I do think. Whereas, yes, culturally, um, certainly legally, like same-sex marriage is not uh, recognized and um, LGBT people don't have, you know, legal rights um, versus like people in everyday life. Like, I think, especially the younger generation of Japan, it's a little more accepted. So what gets put in manga, it's maybe not always like super explicit, like said, like, oh, this is a, a couple. But like, if you're reading it, it's it's quite obvious and like, in some ways that's sort of to get past censors, but also like um, in a way that like, it doesn't need to be said, if that makes sense. Um, so I think that maybe sometimes if you want like more um, representation, you really just have to maybe like look a little deeper um, and things like that, so. Okay, so I'm gonna jump a couple of questions and we're gonna focus now on maybe some titles that we recommend, so the question that I have are what manga titles can you recommend that have positive representation of girls and women and or are there any mangaka that you think we should consider and go ahead okay well so we'll go alphabetical so I will start um I'll just start with one I think we've all brought a few um but my first one that I would really want to um, suggest is uh, Witch Hat Atelier. Yeah, I'm sure, I think everyone's really heard of this. Uh, I think it is, it's fantasy. I think it is a very good alternative to Harry Potter, if you want to give uh, kids an alternative. Um, and it is technically seinen, so it is technically like aimed at adult men, but um, personally, I think that it could work for middle-aged students. I, obviously, I would leave that decision to librarians, but, um, the main character is a young girl. I think she's like 10 to 12. She learns the secret of magic in her world, um, but then she accidentally um, turns her mother to stone. So she goes off to learn to be a witch in order to eventually cure her mother. And she's also embroiled in this. There's this secret society of evil witches and, and things, you know, so there's all this like mystery going on in the background. 
but it has like the main cast is like three or four young girls and they all have their own stories and motivations and personalities um and you know there's a an okay amount of diversity i think in manga there's like diversity is not always the best um but in this particular one i think mostly in background characters but the um artist really does show um a wide range uh, of character designs and things like that um yeah so that would be my first suggestion um i am going to first suggest um uku the inner chambers um i think is a really feminist work um it's an interesting alternate history of japan during the shogunate era era um and it is uh, basically uh, Japan's male population gets dropped down to like a quarter of what it should be. And so women become the dominant gender in Japan, but there's still being since, there's still so much going on because previously it was a patriarchal society and they're still kind of unraveling it. And it's a really fascinating take on it. And um, it's just a really fascinating work. Um, I, I think it's well worth reading and just kind of delving into. So I didn't see this earlier, but um, I have a, a very robust manga collection at my school. We've got over a thousand volumes. And like I would personally like go and buy uh, like anime and like like buy tons of manga and like bring them for my students but for a long time I was not reading any manga myself so now when we're in quarantine Nicola's doing this manga challenge and like, like a little right before that I had started reading like my first manga I was very excited um so I have a couple recommendations but I I'm also sure that I'm not as well read as some of the other folks on this panel I really like Not Your Idol um it talks about idol culture and also just sort of like toxic masculinity, internalized um, misogyny. Um, and I also really like Blank Canvas, my my so-called artist journey. And it was like very wholesome um, and kind of like a visual memoir of this mangaka. It was really fun. Yeah, I would double, I would uh, second that for uh, Blank Canvas. It's a wonderful uh, kind of autobiographical story about Akiko Higashimori's relationship with her um, art teacher and all the and going from high school from school to college and just how she was how her teacher inspired her but he's not an easy teacher to love <laughs> it's a great story it's a real I warn you though it's a tearjerker <laughs> um, Akiko Higashimura does wonderful books uh, from a woman's point of view Princess Jellyfish is one about an ugly duckling who finds um, moves in with a bunch of nerds in a dorm and starts a fashion career thanks to this cross-dressing uh, rich boy. <laughs> it's, it's it's a trip. Um, Tokyo Tarareba Girls is also really great for uh, older female readers. Um, she has a couple of titles that aren't real that are translated, but but I hope these titles succeed and there's more of it. I'm gonna recommend something a little bit off the beaten path, and that's um, O Maidens in Your Savage Season by Mari Okada. And that's an interesting look at uh, a girls' literature club, and they they start discovering sex, or they start talking about sex and relationships in a way that feels very real and true for high school girls. Um, it's written by Mari Okada, who did a who's uh, written a lot of really great um, anime, and I think it's a it's an interesting and touching story. I will say that if you're interested in getting a better understanding of fan service, check out My Dress Up Darling. <laughs> It's a interesting manga about cosplay, about a girl who loves cosplay and a boy who makes traditional Japanese dolls. There's a shy romance between them, but she gets dressed in very suggestive ways. So while it is full of chock full of really helpful and useful information about cosplay, it's full of fan service. <laughs> All right, on to Sarah. Okay, so the first one I am going to uh, recommend is something near and dear to my library heart, and that's Library Wars by Kikuyumi. Uh, the main character is a female, and her 
like goal in life is to be able to beat people. <laughs> like she wants to protect the library. Um, and she told her parents she's going into library services, like the checkout book side. And then secretly she goes into like the combat side. So it's kind of like a Fahrenheit 451 situation where people want to like take the forcibly take books out of the library. And she's part of the military force that is protecting all of that. Um, so yeah, so she's like super BA like strong. And I mean, she's got her moments where she's weak and, and feminine and all of that too. And it's, it's not like a, a weakness for her. Like she gets to have her vulnerable moments too. Oh, I, I kind of did this a little differently. I was thinking of a character in a manga that I thought was a really strong representation. And then I did it like reverse the character and then the manga. So I was thinking of Emma from the Promised Neverland. And despite having found out the truth of her existence, she still remained optimistic and loving and compassionate and selfless. And I thought that was really great. Um, I was thinking of Kaori in Your Lie in April. Uh, while she learns, you know, she's sick and she knows she doesn't have long to live, she's still a very independent and courageous and empathetic uh, character. I also wanted to give a shout out to the Kafna, the librarians and Megas of the library. Oh my goodness, those librarians are amazing. And also some of the female characters in Demon Slayer, um, pretty strong characters. But I think because we have a lot of titles that we're going to share, we're going to add them to a resource doc that we'll share during the webinar. Because um, we could talk about this forever, but for the sake of time. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. I want to thank the experts and the attendees who will be participating in the conversation during our live, our live stream. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at NISLA for more information about our upcoming webinar, Manga and Libraries. Our next webinar will happen in July and will focus on manga and anime programming in libraries. Uh, registration for that will be released shortly. <laughs> Excuse me, this recording will be posted on the NISLA website and the GNCRT, GNCRT websites. So thank you so much. Take care, have a wonderful night and we'll see you soon. <laughs> thank you.